What's going on, bottom line viewers? It's Mitch back here for another NFL video. In this video, I'm going to be counting down the top 10 free agency moves of 2018. These are the best moves from free agency this offseason, including signings and trades. Let's kick it off with number 10. Number 10 is the Chicago Bears signing Allen Robinson, formerly of the Jacksonville Jaguars. The Bears went out. They knew they needed some offense. They knew they needed targets for their young quarterback, Mitchell Trubisky, and they went out and they signed the best option at the wide receiver position in free agency. The Bears sign Allen Robinson. Allen Robinson is now scheduled to make $14 million per season, which would put him right along some of the elite receivers in the game, actually the same number as Des Bryant and Demarius Thomas. And Allen Robinson was a guy that actually received less money from the Bears than Sammy Watkins did from the Kansas City Chiefs. So, that being said, Allen Robinson, pretty fair contract in free agency, where free agency you usually overpay for players. The Bears don't overpay for Allen Robinson, a wide receiver who is big, who can go deep, he can run routes across the middle of the field, take hits. He's a very good, solid number one receiver. He's going to give Mitchell Trubisky a guy to go to in big situations, a guy to go to in the red zone. And Allen Robinson has proven that he can be an elite player in this league. Really like this signing from the Bears' point of view. They knew they needed targets. They knew they needed some magic, some playmakers on the offense. They went out and they got one of the best to do it. So, Allen Robinson at number 10 for the Chicago Bears, a very talented overall wide receiver that will immediately impact the Chicago offense. At number 9, I have the Green Bay Packers signing Muhammad Wilkerson. Now, I really think this is a great signing because Muhammad Wilkerson, he leaves the Jets, a place where really he hasn't been producing the last couple of seasons. But we look back at Muhammad Wilkerson as a guy that from the 3-4 defensive end position has put up some dominant sack numbers in the past. He's been considered the best player at that 3-4 defensive end position in seasons past. He's dominated from that position, and he's still not really past his prime. He's still in his prime, and he's a player that goes to Green Bay for only one year, $5 million. That being said, if you're getting a underachieving Muhammad Wilkerson, a player that maybe he is not what he used to be, hey, it's only one year. It's only $5 million. This is a contract that's filled with incentives. This is a contract that motivates Muhammad Wilkerson to play at that next level, to play the way he used to be playing. So not only is he motivated by playing on a team that's good, that has a chance to win a Super Bowl with Aaron Rodgers, but also he's on a in a contract situation where it asks him to play better because then he can make basically half the money he's already making on top of the money he's making. Playing in a defense that he's familiar with, playing with a coordinator that he's familiar with, it all screams to be a good signing. Plus, the Packers really needed defensive help. I've been all over the Packers the last couple of years for not surrounding Aaron Rodgers with a competent defense. They go out there, they get one of the best in free agency on defense, especially across the defensive line, to help get after that quarterback. Now the Packers have a solid all-around pass rush with Muhammad Wilkerson. They have Mike Daniels. They have Clay Matthews. They have Nick Perry. So they have some guys that can get after the passer. They still need to work a little bit on their secondary, but Muhammad Wilkerson will definitely provide some defensive help in both the pass and the run game for the Packers, a team, like I said, that's looking to do damage in the playoffs. So at number nine, I have the Packers signing Muhammad Wilkerson. At number eight, I have the San Francisco 49ers signing Richard Sherman. Richard Sherman, he leaves Seattle. He goes to the enemy in San Francisco. He returns home to San Francisco and he signs a three-year, $27 million deal. Now, that looks like a fair deal overall for Richard Sherman and the 49ers on both sides. But when you really take a look at it, this is a brilliant deal from the 49ers' point of view. Richard Sherman really didn't have a lot of bargaining angles, you know? He is a player that is great, Hall of Fame standards, but he's a player that's coming off a really serious injury two serious injuries. He had Achilles injuries to both of his feet. So that being said, Richard Sherman, his dead cap is almost nothing. 
Now, what that means is that, yes, the 49ers are signed up for like seven to nine million per year. It's it's basically averages out to nine million per year. But when you look at it, it's a three year deal where after the first season, if Richard Sherman is completely done, he can't run anymore and he sucks. You only have to lose two million from your cap. Right. Because basically his contract two million in dead money after year one, one million in year three. So Richard Sherman, what you're getting in this contract is no downside. And basically the upside is you're getting potentially one of the best or the best corner in the NFL. I'm not, I don't think he'll be the best corner in the NFL in the next coming years, but he does have the potential to be one of the best corners in the NFL like he was before the injury. Plus, I feel like Richard Sherman could have the versatility to play a safety position if he really wanted to, and I think he could provide something on the field from that position if you really don't think he's made out to be a corner maybe after year one and year two he has to shift positions. But I have enough confidence that Richard Sherman is a smart enough player, is a big enough body where he's six foot three. He still has that advantage over a lot of receivers in the NFL. And like I said, very intelligent. Plus, he's playing in the scheme where that he played in Seattle. Not a lot of difference there, so he'll be very comfortable. Plus, he's a guy that I really feel I'm a huge fan of Richard Sherman when it comes to his his off the field, his ability to lead a defense, his ability to bring confidence, his ability to bring bravado to a defense. And also he's going to be able to school these young 49ers players in what it is like to win, what it is like to be in a winning locker room, what it is like to be in a locker room that maybe not a lot of people are really agreeing with the situation that's going on in the franchise. He has that experience. And I feel like Richard Sherman can bring a lot of different things to this young 49ers team that is really much needed not only his talent as a corner but also his talent as a professional and as a leader so at number eight i have the 49ers signing richard sherman at number seven i have the rams trading for marcus peters we go from one corner in the nfc west to another corner in the nfc west the rams of course send the chiefs a 2018 fourth and a 2019 second rounder in exchange for marcus peters and a sixth round pick this season so pretty much we're looking at a third this year and a, and a fourth this year because a second next year pretty much equates to a third this year for Marcus Peters, who is an elite corner and a sixth rounder. So that being said, this is a really, really good deal for the Rams. Not to mention that Marcus Peters is making less than $2 million this year. Less than $2 million for an elite corner, for the corner that's led the league in interceptions since he has joined the NFL. Yes, they have to re-sign him next year, but it will be well worth it. Yes, Marcus Peters has had a little bit of anger issues, you could say, on the field and is a little bit of a head case, but he's a guy that's going to change games. He is a guy that's going to turn the football over. He is a guy that can shut down receivers. Marcus Peters is a very good top-notch number one corner, and it's going to be very intriguing to see him in a system with Wade Phillips, more of a man coverage system where he will be responsible for shutting down players. Wade Phillips brings the best out of defensive players, the best out of cornerbacks. Ask Aqib Tlaib. That's the reason why he wanted to go to the Rams. Marcus Peters' play is only going to elevate. His motivation is only going to rise by being traded from the Chiefs and by being on a contract year. The Rams are going to get the absolute best out of Marcus Peters. This was a brilliant trade, and this immediately rises the Rams in terms of their ability to play defense and their flexibility in coverage because they have a guy like Marcus Peters and they've brought a turnover machine. They brought a playmaker to their defense that's in the secondary as opposed to just their defensive line with Aaron Donald. So now they have playmakers at multiple levels of their defense. It's going to be very intriguing to see Marcus Peters play for the Rams, but I love this move at number seven. At number six, I have the New England Patriots trades. Now, this is multiple moves, but seeing as how the Patriots traded twice with one team, it sort of counts. And then I just added the other trade because I felt like the Patriots did more of their damage 
this offseason in trading than they did in free agency. Now, they signed a couple of free agents, and I thought those pickups were very good. And a lot of people are getting on the Patriots for not retaining Malcolm Butler or Nate Solder or Dion Lewis. But the Patriots, if you really looked at it, did improve, at least on defense, and really had a good free agency. I mean, look at these trades that they made. They basically gave up nothing and got in returned starting players that will help them for very minimal contracts. Now, the first trade is for Danny Shelton. The reason Danny Shelton has been traded is because he doesn't fit the Cleveland defensive scheme. In the past, he was drafted by a guy that was in a different 3-4 scheme where he was able to play nose tackle. What do the Patriots need? They need a run-stuffing nose tackle. They were not very good against the run last year. If anybody watched the Super Bowl, you could clearly see that. Danny Shelton is a beast against the run. Last year, the Browns ranked in the top five, second in yards per carry in the NFL. They were good at that. They were 0-16 team that was good at stopping the run because of Danny Shelton. You watch tape of this guy. He blows up centers. He blows up guards. He pushes guys against, against up into the quarterback, and he stops the run. And Danny Shelton is a beast. He's still a young player. He's only 25 years old. And the Browns, they get a third-round pick next year. And the Patriots get Danny Shelton, plus they get a fifth rounder this year. So pretty much you're talking about trading a fourth rounder for Danny Shelton and a fifth rounder. Brilliant trade by the New England Patriots. Then what did they need? Well, they lost Malcolm Butler, so they need to bring in a corner. The Browns, they're trading Jason McCourty. Jason McCourty was, according to Pro Football Focus, a number one corner in the NFL last year, playing better than Malcolm Butler playing better than alternatives like Richard Sherman on the market, and Jason McCourty comes in for no money, $3 million this year, and they trade a seventh or sixth round pick and get back a seventh. So pretty much they traded nothing for Jason McCourty, and they pay him $3 million. The Patriots get Jason McCourty for nothing. They get Danny Shelton for barely anything, and then the Patriots go out and they swap a fifth round pick to the Raiders for a sixth round pick in order to get Cordero Patterson, the best kick returner in the NFL, the second best kick returner per average in NFL history, and the Patriots add this guy to their special teams to replace Danny Amendola as a punt returner, to replace Deion Lewis as a kick returner, to add to their gunner um, position, which is already stacked with Matthew Slater. So the Patriots have just improved their team in two facets of the game, on defense and on special teams with these three trades where they pretty much gave up nothing and they're paying these players pretty much nothing for their value. The Patriots, Bill Belichick, they do it again with these trades. That's why they're at number six. At number five, I have the Bills and Bengals, Cordy Glenn trade. Now, the reason why I say Bills and Bengals is because I feel like this is beneficial to both teams. This is a great trade on both sides. I especially love it because of what the Bengals did. The Bengals really needed offensive line help. Cordy Glenn is a good caliber, borderline at times Pro Bowl talent left tackle. He's very good. He's quality. And the Buffalo Bills traded him and their 21 overall pick this year in the NFL draft to move up nine spots to get the number 12 pick. They're also swapping fifth and sixth round picks. But the Bills and Bengals make a great trade. From the Bengals' point of view, like I said, they needed a tackle. They needed an offensive line help. They also move back in the draft. They don't need a quarterback. doesn't really matter. They're moving back. They probably need a pass rusher, maybe a linebacker, something on defense, maybe an offensive lineman again. So they get an offensive lineman, fit their need, and they move back to get something that they'll need later on in the draft. Perfect for the Bengals. Great trade. You look at the Buffalo Bills. They need a quarterback. Yeah, they they signed A.J. McCarron, but he'll be sort of a bridge guy. They still need to get a top quarterback, and they'll probably need to trade up again. But is Cordy Glenn really too much to give in order to trade up for a future star quarterback? No, it isn't because Cordy Glenn, he was injured last year, and even though he is very good, like I said, you had a guy replace him and play pretty well last year. So the Bills, the Bengals, quality trade for both sides. That's why I have it at number five. 
At number four, I have the Houston Texans signing Tyron Matthew for one year, seven million. Nothing. Cheapo. I thought Tyron Matthew would be 10 plus million dollars. He's a star safety in the league. He can play uh, slot corner. He can play free safety, strong safety. He could play in the box as a linebacker at times. Tyron Matthew has the versatility to play a number of positions. And as many coaches in the NFL, across the NFL, have stated, this is one of the most crucial, important positions. Not only can he stop slot receivers, but he can also stop tight ends. He can also play against the run. He has that versatility, and he is a playmaker. He can make interceptions. He can turn it around, and he can go the other way. He's around the ball 24-7, and Tyron Matthews is the type of player that can definitely bring a, a different confidence, a different playmaking ability to your secondary which the Houston Texans desperately needed they desperately needed this type of player in their secondary they have it in the front seven they have abundance of it in the front seven if JJ Watt comes back and plays well you have that you have Jadavian Clowney who's already a stud you have Whitney Merciless who's coming back from injury you have solid linebackers but by adding a Tyron Matthew you have this chess piece you didn't have before and it's for one year seven million on a prove it deal it's good for both sides because if Matthew performs, he'll get a huge contract in the offseason, and he's on a team that has the capability of going to the Super Bowl if all things go their way. So the Texans, great move overall, getting Tyron Matthew. At number three, I have the Vikings signing Kirk Cousins, of course, the biggest, biggest splash in the free agency this season, uh, and Kirk Cousins... I know there's some haters out there, but to me, he's a top 10, borderline top 10 quarterback in the NFL. He's really been surrounded by some lackluster talent, especially last year. He carried a team that really was injuries everywhere, and he's been one of the most consistent stat producers in the NFL over the past three to four years. Ever since he really got the starting gig, he has brought a team to the playoffs. He has performed in big time, and to me, Kirk Cousins is a huge improvement over what the Vikings already had at the position, and he is a player that can take your team like the Vikings were to the next level, to the Super Bowl level, to the championship level, and that's what the Vikings needed. They needed a player that could take their team from this point at NFC Championship loser to Super Bowl champion, and Kirk Cousins was one of the only, if not the only player in free agency that could do that for you, I don't care what the money is, 28 per year. It's only two years, too. So, you know, if he sucks for whatever reason or if it really just doesn't work out, maybe you don't quite get what you expected, then, hey, Kirk Cousins is gone after two years. It is what it is. We tried it, but we're going to get our money back in two years. But we have this window with this defense, with these playmakers, uh, with Stephon Diggs, with Adam Thielen, with Dalvin Cook coming back. We have all the players except the quarterback. So they come in, they sign the quarterback. Now you have the potential to win the Super Bowl. Great signing for the Vikings. Good move for Kirk Cousins going to Minnesota. At number two, you have the Kansas City Chiefs absolutely robbing the Washington Redskins for Alex Smith. The Chiefs get a third round pick and Kendall Fuller for Alex Smith. Now the third round pick is nice, but you also have Kendall Fuller, who Kendall Fuller is a 23-year-old corner who was rated the number one slot corner by Pro Football Focus last year, or number two, one of the top two guys, and he's 23, like I said. Less than a million dollars he's going to be making for the next two years. This year, next year, you have to pay this guy less than a million, and he's a top slot corner. Plus, you have the rights to, when he is 25, you can sign him to a long-term contract. Great move. You needed a corner, especially after trading Marcus Peters. The lost thing about this trade is that the Chiefs have Patrick Mahomes. They were going to trade Alex Smith. Alex Smith needed to leave. They weren't going to pay him. So they get a third, which is already quality, plus they get the corner for Alex Smith. And number one, I have the Colts trade with the New York Jets. This is a great move for the Indianapolis Colts. The Jets, they traded up three slots in the first round to number three overall to get their quarterback. Fair enough. I won't really say that that's a bad move because they had to get a quarterback. They need a quarterback. 
And although I don't understand why they have four quarterbacks on their roster already and then are going to pick one in the first round, that doesn't make sense from the Jets' point of view, and that is dumb. But like I said earlier, I'm talking about the good of the move and not the bad of the move. For the Colts, this is amazing because, yes, Andrew Luck's been injured, but you have Andrew Luck who, when he's when he is playing, he's a top 10 quarterback. And then you have Jacoby Brissett, who's a fine backup. I mean, he came in, he played solid football for you. So it's not really like you need a quarterback. You're not just going to give up on Andrew Luck because he's hurt right now. So you move back three spots. You only move back three spots. So you're at number six overall. And when you look at the draft, you have probably the first, arguably the first four picks are all going to be quarterbacks, which is, again, the position you don't need. And then when you look at number five and number six overall, you do have the capability to move at number move to number five if you really want to, but you don't need to move to number five. So at number one, the Browns are probably going to pick quarterback, right? So then at number two, the Giants could pick a quarterback. They might go Saquon Barkley. Okay, whatever. And then at number three, you have um, another team that needs a quarterback in the Jets, who you just traded with because you know they need a quarterback. And number four, the Browns. Okay, the Browns. They may trade back with the Bills, another team that needs a quarterback, or they take they take Saquon Barkley if he's there or they take, um, you know, Bradley Chubb, maybe. I don't know. And then you have the, the Colts at number six who could get anybody they want. Basically, they could get one of the top players in the draft, whether that's in the secondary, whether that's on the offensive line, whether that's a running back, a pass rusher. Whatever it may be, the Colts have the capability of doing that. Plus, they have a they have three second round picks. They have one at the top of the f- second round. They have one um, in the middle of the second round, and then they get another one in 2019. And who's to say the Jets aren't going to be bad again next year? So you're getting three potential high second round picks for moving down three spots when you didn't need the position that the other team was trading up to get. Best move of free agency by far from the Colts' point of view. Those are the top 10 free agency moves of 2018. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel for more NFL and NFL free agency and NFL draft coverage. If you guys did enjoy, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, support the channel. We're trying to make our way up in the YouTube community, in the NFL community. I hope you guys join us on that journey. It's Mitch. Peace out.